Worth, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Swerve Buffy Bocconi webinar on expanding zero interest minimum reserve requirements, aims, effects, and side effects. Paul de Graue and UMA G suggested recently to expand the minimum reserve requirements for banks in the euro area, for instance, by a factor of 10, thereby increasing it to 1.65 trillion euro and stopping to remunerate them. Only reserves held in excess of the minimum reserve requirement would be remunerated at the deposit facility rate currently 4%. As a result, the subsidies to commercial banks by the euro system through reserve remuneration would be reduced. In this seminar, the authors and a panel of experts from central banks, academia and the financial sector will discuss the aims, the transmission channels, the potential benefits and undesirable side effects of such a measure. May I first invite Paul and Julian May to present their proposal in 20 minutes and then I will hand over to Stefan Schmitz head of the Financial Stability and Macro Prudential Supervision Division of the Austrian Central Bank, who will moderate the following panel discussion. As all of you know, Paul de Graue is a famous professor from the London School of Economics who has been working on matters of monetary uh, policy and related matters for decades. And uh, Jürgen Meijin is also a professor of economics at University College London and her areas of expertise are European macroeconomics and international finance. Without further ado, Paul and you may, may I hand over to you. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, thanks also for inviting us to uh, give a talk. I will start and you may then will take over and also conclude. And the title of our presentation is inflation, fighting inflation more effectively without transferring central banks profits to banks. By way of introduction, let me just show you some numbers here. Um, as you know, to fight inflation, central banks have been raising interest rates since uh, the end of 2021. Um, and the way they have done that is by raising the uh, interest rate paid out on bank reserves, the rate of remuneration on bank reserves. But since these bank reserves are now quite massive, as a result of quantitative easing of the past, uh, during some from 2015 in the Eurozone, um, central banks have been buying government bonds in massive amounts. Um, and when they do that, they credit the accounts of financial institutions at the central bank. And this has led to a huge increase in um, bank reserves at this moment. And this is the case for the ECB, but also the Fed and the Bank of England. And in that table, you can see here the size of these bank reserves. We have also in the next column indicated the interest rates that apply, um, the rate of remuneration on these deposits. And then uh, the, the next column shows you the transfers that are now being made to commercial banks. The, the EU system transfers now about 146 billion on an annual basis to commercial banks, which is more than 1% of GDP. And we have similar numbers, but even more so in the Bank of England. So these are really substantial numbers. And to give some perspective for the Eurozone, um, if you know that the yearly spending by the European Union amounts to 165 billion, then you can see that banks obtain almost the same amount of money on a yearly basis at this moment, right? An extraordinary situation uh, because there has been no political decision about this um, and the banks receive this, this money unconditionally while all the money that the EU is disbursing is usually um, attached to, to a lot of condition. So as a result of this anti-inflationary policy, central banks transfer now more than the total of the seniorage to private banks and make significant losses. As I said, this is quite extraordinary. Um, note that the previous episode of uh, inflation fighting during the 1970s and 80s, central banks also raised the interest rate dramatically, but they didn't make losses, they made profits because they did not remunerate bank reserves. So here, 
we have an inflation fighting regime where central banks make massive losses, but this is unique in the recent history. Um, what's the origin of this problem? Let me show you demand and supply. I think this will be okay for um, everybody in, in, in such a group of, of people. Here, what I show you is the demand and the supply of reserve in a reserve abundance regime that we know today. So on the vertical axis, I set out the money market interest rate or the interbank rate. On the horizontal axis, you see demand and supply of reserves. And the demand is a negatively sloped line. It says that when the um, money market rate increases, the demand for bank reserves by commercial banks will decline. Uh, the supply curve has been shifted dramatically to the right because of quantitative easing of the past, as I indicated earlier. And as a result, we are now in a situation where there is excess supply of bank reserves, um, reserve abundance. And as you can see immediately, equilibrium in that uh, market uh, would imply actually a negative interest rate because you would have to extend the supply and the demand curve in negative territory. And this is not possible. And as a result, uh, the horizontal axis acts as the lower bound for the interest rate in the reserve abundance regime. So this also means that if nothing else happens, the interest rate cannot increase. So how do you fight inflation in such an environment of reserve abundance? Well, by remunerating um, the, the reserves. And, and this is shown here by the horizontal green line, the RD, the deposit rate that now applies. And in the Eurozone, this is now 4%. So by raising uh, and the deposit rate, the, the floor is raised, right? That's also why it's called the floor system. So the, the interest rate in the market cannot be below the green line. Today, this is 4%. So this is the floor that is put in, in the system. So that's the way this is done today. But of course, the collateral damage of this is that the central bank has to transfer large amount of money to commercial banks. So that's the origin of the, the problem. So I want to, the issues that we want to analyze now are the following. First, we will go through some of the problems that um, arise as a result of remunerating bank reserves. Then I will discuss the alternative operating procedures that do not transfer large amounts of money to banks. And I will discuss our proposal. And then um, you may will take over with um, an analysis of the effectiveness of the current regime. The political economy problems of, of these transfers, what are they? Well, essentially, we can say that what happens now is that um, the, the profits that central banks have, because they have obtained the monopoly power to issue money, base money, um, that monopoly profit, instead of being returned to the government, is actually returned to private agents, which then leads to large losses for the central banks. And here I show you the, 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 a study that has been done by the IMF that uh, shows the size of these losses for a number of central banks in the Eurozone. And the, the blue, uh, blue sticks there uh, represent the, the yearly profits and losses and also an extrapolation to the future based on a number of assumptions that the IMF has been doing. And so we can see large losses today for the Bundesbank, the Bank de France, Bank of Spain, Surprisingly, not for the Banca d'Italia. Um, we have also indicated the cumulative losses. This is the red line. And you can see that it, for the Bundesbank, it will take a lot of time before it, it gets over this, right? So there will be a relatively long period of significant losses that could endanger the equity position of uh, uh, the bank. This, of course, has fiscal implications. Um, namely the following, by paying interest on bank reserve accounts, the, the central banks transforms long-term government debt into short-term debt, right? And the long-term government debt was issued in the past at a very low interest rates. And as a result, governments that were holding, that were issued, had issued this debt, um, profited now from um, the, the rising interest rates. But by paying an interest rate of 4% in the Eurozone, uh, so the, this long-term debt is transformed into highly liquid debt and leads and forces actually the, the, the public sector to pay large amounts of 
um, money to, to commercial banks. And this contributes to higher budget deficits and increasing government debt, which is quite paradoxical as we see that central banks contribute to a worsening of the fiscal outlook for the government. Uh, let me, because of time, I want to quickly go a little faster. Um, le let me now, so I've indicated what the problems are um, of uh, this present situation. There are certainly more, but we may discuss them. What are the alternatives? How can we solve this? W one possibility would be to, uh, when you look at this demand and supply that I showed you, to bring back the supply line, right? To bring it back to the left so that it intersects the demand curve in the negatively sloped uh, line. And then that would allow you to reduce the size of the transfer significantly. But you cannot do it very quickly. If you do it too quickly, that is by selling government bonds, you may create havoc in government bond markets and as a result, um, in instability. And, as a, and it also follows that central banks have announced that they want to do that in a gradual way. The Fed and the Bank of England also have announced they want to maintain a reserve abundant prom, um, regime, right? So they, they don't want to get out of this, which means that these payments to commercial banks are here to stay. Um, for the Eurozone, there is a, a particular problem that is that if the uh, ECB uh, and the central banks of the system were to sell too quickly, this could lead to increases in the spreads. We have seen it in the recent past that the spreads equally uh, quickly can increase. Here I show you the spreads over the, the last uh, three years. And you can see that with the pandemic, the spreads increased very strongly. Again, with the increase in inflation, spreads increased uh, quickly. And as a result, a too quick um, quantitative tightening may destabilize the bond markets in, in the system. So then we come to um, our proposal, which is a two-tier system where we will do the following. Um, and I refer again to the demand and the supply curve. Um, we would tell the banks the, the, the good news. Uh, listen, uh, part of the bank reserves on which you are remunerated will not be remunerated and will be required reserves that, you, um, that, that are blocked temporarily. And um, I present this in this graph by a displacement of the demand curve to the right. So the, the initial demand curve shifts to the right, given by the size of the minimum reserve requirements. And the advantage of a system like this is the following. Um, it allows you to reduce the transfers, but that will depend on the size of the minimum reserves. Here we have a number of simulations, minimum reserves of 1%, which is the present situation, 5, 10, and 15%. Um, the, the next column then indicates how many minimum reserves there are, and then the reduction in the transfers that are obtained. And, but the advantage of the system, if you have minimum reserve requirements, say between 0 and 10%, is that you can maintain um, the operating procedure of the central bank because you will still have large amount of excess reserves, and at the same time, you will have reduced the transfers considerably. Okay, and now I leave the floor to you, May. So I'm now going to talk a bit about the transmission of monetary policy in the current remuneration regime, um, <clears throat> whether it's effective. Um, so as you know, that there's a, um, a very interesting theory focusing on the um, equity channel of the bank lending. Um, and then um, this theory uh, assumes that the, when the bank uh, equity position improves, and then actually they would have more incentive to, to lend. And this is because um, when they have higher equity position, they are more likely to satisfy the minimum capital reserve requirement, oh no, sorry, the capital requirement imposed by the regulators, and therefore the banks um, have more incentive to lend. Um, the other important reason is when the equity position improves, the cost of borrowing for banks also tends to decline, and therefore they are more likely to, to, to have more bank lending. So I, we believe that the massive remuneration um, on bank reserves leads to better um, equity position 
of the banks. And therefore, um, this channel of bank lending and is more likely to, um, to increase, um, um, give incentive for the banks to, to lend more. And therefore, um, um, and the, the, the interest rate increase is likely to, um, to have um, kind of weakening um, effect on the trans transmission of monetary policy. Our evaluation is based on some empirical tests. Um, actually, the, this equity channel um, ha has been um, tested by many um, um, studies in the past and related to bank re remuner remuneration. Um, this, this test has also been done by other studies. Uh, for example, Carol and then his colleagues um, at the Bundesbank, they use more recent data uh, based on the a bank level data. However, um, our uh, presentation is more about the country level, aggregate level data at the empirical evidence we collected since September 2022. 20, uh, um, uh, we, we analyze the, the change in the aggregate loans to non-financial uh, corporations and the household and how um, these variables uh, actually is affected by the interest rate, which is very important. And then the other very important variable is the remuneration change um, at the aggregate level. Um, Paul, can you give me the next slide? Yeah. <clears throat> and here I'm just going to be very brief to show you um, some of the results. The, um, one important result uh, we look at the loan to non-financial corporation. Um, and then what we find on the screen, you can see that the highlight, the, the, uh, the one in yellow, the coefficients related to the, the policy rate, that indeed that uh, we expect that uh, the policy where it has a negative impact on the lending um, to non-financial cooperation. And then we also find a very important equity channel that is related to the change, the improvement in the remuneration uh, to banks. And actually this, this effect offsets the, 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 the positive, uh, the negative interest rate uh, channel. And then therefore this give a very consistent evidence at the uh, aggregation level um, about the, the ineffectiveness, or, or you can say that the effectiveness of the monetary policy actually has been uh, reduced. How do we interpret the empirical study? Let's visualize the result. So um, there's a direct impact related to the bank lending um, policy rate, um, which reduced the, 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 uh, the, the, the demand for, uh, for borrowing. Um, actually, the vertical line, you can say that the direct impact is about minus 1.5%. However, because of the equity uh, effect, which tends to offset uh, this interest rate, policy rate <clears throat> effect, and you, uh, on the screen, you can see, see that um, there, the overall effect um, of the interest rate uh, policy we see um, tends to um, be much more reduced. And then the distribution of that, as you can see, um, it's very diverse. And then the overall effect is very much related to uh, the existing um, uh, reserve um, in, the, in the banking um, system. Um, so um, our finding, actually the implication of the, our finding is, is that um, the, the monetary policy that has been uh, raising the interest rate and by remuneration the banks, um, the, the, the effectiveness actually has been very much reduced. And then if you look at our two-tier system policy, um, by reducing um, the remuneration, then actually, which we, we tend to think that this, this can improve the, the, the effectiveness of the uh, monetary policy transmission. Um, I think we have quite a lot of time. <laughs> and so I'm going to conclude here. Um, so uh, our the large transfers of the central bank's profits to commercial, um, commercial banks, we believe that um, 
um, these are without clear sufficient economic justifications. Um, as Paul has argued that um, they are uh, extremely unfair and then um, our empirical result also uh, leads to the conclusion that um, they reduce the effectiveness of monetary policy to fight inflation. Um, um, so that's why we propose the two-tier system of reserve res requirement. And we think that this can reduce the fairness problem. Um, then this can also improve the effectiveness of the monetary policy. Uh, we believe that we have the, now have the window opportunity to introduce such a better system today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul and UMA. I now hand over to Stefan for moderating the panel. Thank you very much for your time discipline. Let me introduce the four panelists. Nicolas Charnet is Managing Director and Sector Lead for European Banks at Standard & Poor's. His role is to oversee the analytical rating process on large European banks and to lead the research efforts of S&P on key sectoral trends. Uh, Claudia Kvapil is a Senior Principal at the monetary policy section at the Austrian Central Bank, a colleague of mine. She is specialized in the fields of monetary policy transmission, as well as the design of central bank operational frameworks for steering the short-term policy rate. Robert McCauley is a non-resident senior fellow at the Global Policy Center at Boston University and a research associate at the uh, Faculty of History, University of Oxford. And last but not least, uh, Karol Balutkiewicz is a senior research economist uh, in the Directorate General Markets at Deutsche Bundesbank, and his research focuses on the empirical analysis of monetary policy transmission through financial intermediaries and financial markets. Now, all of the four now have uh, eight minutes in turn. Please stick to the time as uh, Paul and Jume did. And we start with Nicolas Charnet. Good afternoon to all. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, firstly, I would like to, to thank very much Prof. De Gove and Prof. G for uh, bringing this topic in the public debate. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic. I will uh, uh, speak today uh, on behalf of S&P Global Ratings and, and just maybe a word of introduction. I speak here as, as a bank analyst. My job and the job of my team is to assess the creditworthiness of banks in Europe that we rate. Uh, so I'm not here speaking in terms of uh, the uh, relevance or the interest of rising uh, uh, of raising in, uh, required reserves from the perspective of monetary policy, for instance. Uh, nor am I speaking as a citizen as to whether that makes sense from the distributional effects of these policies, etc. But really focusing on the impact that this could have on on banks that we rate uh, in the eurozone. So with that introduction, maybe I think it's interesting to start with two words of background on Eurozone banks and European banks, how we see them at S&P. I think uh, we've seen a number of shocks in, in recent months, recent quarters, and we've seen a lot of resilience in the banking systems. Uh, we have taken a, a net number of positive rating actions on European banks in the past uh, one and a half years. Uh, we still have, uh, and I will show you a few statistics on ratings in a moment, a vast majority of stable outlooks on European banks. And there are three main reasons for that. I will not elaborate long, but the operating environment for European banks is weakening. We have weaker growth, but we didn't have a recession, so we don't have a dire economic uh, and operating environment for our banks. This translates into lower levels of activity. So we're seeing their balance sheets kind of reducing their growth on the deposits and on the lending side, but we are not seeing so far asset quality uh, really deterioration. Some pockets, like commercial real estate, for instance, are suffering more than others, but there's no massive NPL problem at the moment. And on the other hand, the profitability has been supported by rising interest rates, and that comes into the story, I think, that uh, Prof. De Grove was, was mentioning. So overall, our forecast, and I put some numbers at the bottom, uh, for return on equity, for the capitalization levels, for so the liquidity and funding in the systems are relatively stable. And of course, this is the view overall, there are differences and some very some smaller banks that are more focused, for instance, on commercial real estate are seeing some, some difficulties at the moment. But overall, our, our rating horizon, our rating picture on European banks, I think that's important to keep in mind, is rather fairly resilient and stable. This is the ratings that we have currently on European banks. You can see on the left-hand side, 
that we have 90% of banks in Europe in investment grades, so that's triple B minus and above. Those below investment grades are uh, mainly located in, in Greece, for instance, and, uh, and also one in Italy. Um, so these are high ratings for us. And like I said, on the right-hand side, mainly stable outlooks. Yeah. So that's, I think, my background, where we stand with European banks today and the kind of rating level reflects, reflects that view. So now zooming in on the topic of, uh, of uh, required reserves. So within that broad picture, we, we've run a, a few numbers. Uh, of course, assuming, making certain assumptions on what could happen to two things. Uh, basically, the impact would be one on liquidity ratios and second on profitability. On liquidity ratios, it's because in, under the current rules, and my understanding is that the ECB could decide to change that if it wishes, but under the current rules, at least, required reserves are not eligible for uh, HQLA, so they would be removed from the numerator of the liquidity coverage ratios. This would have a direct impact. So you can see here in the sensitivity table, if you increase required reserves, that takes out uh, uh, some eff effects from the LCR. Uh, the impact overall, uh, and that's back to the point I was making earlier about the resilience and the starting point. The starting point is strong. So even if you take that out, you can look at the sensitivity. You see the numbers at Eurozone level, which is the last line. The numbers has appear to us to be broadly manageable, but there are strong differences. And that would be my main point also in the next slide. They are, we need to look one level down from the system level considerations to look at the differences across systems and also within systems across banks. And here our view is that uh, in some uh, systems, and you can see the numbers, the, the effect would be uh, more important than in other uh, systems, typically. On the profit, it's a bit the same picture. The effects would be there. There would be some, deposit, some dent or some drag on profits. It's overall positive profit story that banks have, unless you assume really very significant increase in minimum required reserves. It seems to be manageable, but again, the impact are not equal. I think the best way to illustrate this impact are not equal is the, the next slide where we look at the effect of uh, required reserves uh, increase on the excess reserves that are there. And I think here a key point is that these excess reserves are not equally distributed across the systems. Um, and so uh, if, if you look, uh, so here uh, we, we took the, the main systems in the, in the Eurozone. Uh, we start with the blue bar with the excess deposits, the excess reserves that they have at the moment. And then we deduct the effect of the TLTRO, which are coming due. There are still some TLTRO repayments, and we took some assumptions on how much this will deplete reserves. And then you, on top of that, add uh, an increase in required reserves. And you can see that in some countries, and that's on the right-hand side, so Italy, Greece, you can see that relatively quickly you hit, uh, at the system level, a situation where some banks have depleted their excess reserves. It's not necessarily a problem. It means that they just have to source uh, reserves beyond that point uh, through other banks, through the interbank market, which at the moment is not happening because they don't have to. Uh, but that's that's something that's been happening. But it's just it's going to put a strain on these banks, of course, in terms of higher funding costs. So maybe that's my humble, um, how to say, uh, contribution to your monetary policy debate, which is the effect would likely be asymmetrical across systems. And therefore, the effect of on bank spending and therefore on borrowing costs in the countries would likely be also uh, asymmetrical, and that could have some some problems for the monetary policy transmission. Um, and then, of course, all of these calculations assume that banks do nothing and just sit and take the, the the hit. Of course, they would not do that. They have a number of ways to react. We live in a global connected financial system, so banks could shift deposits where they are not subject to such required reserves. For instance, but only large banks can do that, not small banks. So the effects would also be uh, a bit at the disadvantage of smaller banks, potentially. Uh, and also banks could seek to offset the loss in, of interest income by moving into yeah. higher risk, uh, for instance, on interest rate risk. So that could also be um, uh, an impact, right? So we have to also think in terms of the reaction function from the banking system, not only um, assuming that they would, that they would uh, take, take the, the, the hit, if you wish. And my last point uh, before handing back over to the next uh, discussant uh, is to, to zoom out from this question of required reserves. What is more of a source of, uh, of uh, uncertainty for us going forward beyond required reserves in and of itself is really the normalization of the monetary policy of the ECB, uh, which is a process that's been started. The discussion on required reserves is one aspect of it uh, as part of the review of the operational framework. The other big aspect is, of course, QT and the reduction of the balance sheet. Uh, 
um, I think here for us, the key is really, and I think uh, Prof. De Grove mentioned that in his, in his speech, is around careful communication and uh, making sure that uh, this doesn't lead to financial stability risks. Uh, we assume in our projections and in our views that the ECB will keep a very gradual approach, very measured approach to all that. But let's bear in mind the uncertainties that I tried to summarize a bit on the left and on the right hand side. Uncertainties in the real economy, the funding needs, especially from governments, and uncertainties in the financial system. So how good is the interest rate risk management of banks and non-bank actors? Um, for instance, as one of them, the money market effects also as well. So for me, beyond required reserves is really the compounding effects of multiple actions that the central bank could take, accelerate QT, hike reserves, potentially change refinancing operations for banks. Um, that, that's the, the combination of all that, that's really more of a, of a question mark and, 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 and the communication of all this as a package. And I think here, and that's my closing remark, I think here I, I view, we view positively the, the fact that the ECB has kept the discussion on reserves uh, as part of the broader framework discussion on the operational review, uh, because this gives a little bit more uh, visibility and, and, and expectation to the market that, you know, that there will be a decision on this broader package of measures by the end of March, I understood. So that's, uh, I think, useful um, to, 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 to continue with this approach. So that concludes, we have more, uh, published more research here, the references, we will circulate the slides. Happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, very time efficient. Now, Claudia, what's your take on the proposal? So thanks a lot for inviting me as a discussant and thanks a lot that I can share my thoughts with you. Um, my thoughts are summarized on the, on the next slide, Dragana. And basically I have, uh, three aspects I would like to consider, and there are all words of caution. Basically, I would like to caution against using a monetary policy instrument, and minimum reserves are a monetary policy instrument if we don't know exactly how it works, and we don't know exactly what kind of effect it will have on the real economy. The second uh, thing is, again, a word of caution, because if we uh, increase minimum reserves, we extract a lot of excess reserves from the system, probably up to a point where the, the small amount of reserves has an effect on uh, money market rates. And again, we will have a stance, a monetary policy stance effect, uh, which we are not quite sure about. And the, my last point is uh, very much in agreement uh, with Nicolas that uh, with this monetary policy instrument, we will introduce heterogeneity in our monetary policy transmission. And this might threaten the, sing the, the idea of having a single monetary policy for the euro area. Let me mention that uh, the opinion I will express in the next uh, seven minutes are uh, mine and uh, will not uh, reflect the official viewpoint of the UNB, the ECB or the Eurosystem. Uh, so each of these three topics will be now discussed by me in turn. And the first one is, and I think we agree on that, that unremunerated reserve requirements are a tax on deposits of non-banks with banks. And the main question here is, how will pass banks this tax on? Uh, so we might agree that they will not uh, sit on this tax, but they will pass it on to their customers. But the question is, will they pass it on to their depositors or will they pass it on to their borrowers? And depending on this decision, this uh, monetary policy instrument will have a different effect on the real economy. If banks pass the tax on to the depositors, it means that in the current environment where we have an increase in policy rates, probably banks will not increase the deposit rates to their customers to the same extent. So policy, uh, so uh, deposit rates are increasing by less than without minimum reserves. So it's uh, a draw, it's uh, working against the tightening of monetary policy. It reduces the tightness of monetary policy. On the other hand, if banks decide to pass on the tax to their borrowers, it might be that they increase the interest rates to their borrowers by more than policy rates increase. So this, uh, this uh, reserve requirement 
adds to the tightening bias of the of the central bank and has a more tightening effect on the real economy. So the the if I want to put it differently, we have a monetary policy instrument at hand, and we do not know what kind of effect it will have on the real economy. So, yeah, we should be cautious. And on top of that, I'm sure that banks will try to escape this tax and will try to circumvent it and try to reduce the base on which minimum reserves are calculated. And we see that already happen in the money markets. We see at the last day of each month, we see that uh, banks are very reluctant to take in overnight deposits on the unsecured money market from non-bank financial intermediaries. And that's why we see that the ESDR is already uh, showing signs of, of uh, volatility at the end of the month. But they also might try to replace retail deposits with wholesale deposits. So somehow banks will try to adjust to the new situation. And we know it will have an effect on the stance, but we don't know which. And if they try to uh, avoid the tax altogether, they might not increase deposit rates enough. So deposit might flee the banking sector and might be shifted to the non-bank financial system which will have a financial stability aspect to it. This would be my first argument. The second one on my next slide is, uh, and here I think I agree very much with the very new paper of uh, Wissing Jorgensen and uh, uh, Lopez Salido, that we, not, we don't know exactly where the demand for reserves, where the curve lies, and we also don't know its exact curvature. We only quite right know is that uh, now we are in a reserve abundance scheme. But if we increase the minimum reserve requirement, we shift the supply of reserves, as Paul showed to us, uh, to the left, probably up to a point, and I indicated it here with an arrow, with the blue arrow, probably up to a point where money market rates will leave the floor and will move towards the middle of the corridor. So we will experience higher volatility in money market rates and higher refinancing costs of banks. So again, this uh, will not be neutral on a monetary policy stance. Leading to me to my very last point on my third slide, um, and this is very much in agreement of, with Nicolas. I show you that uh, excess reserves are not di distributed equally across countries. What I show here is, for example, that uh, if you take, for example, the Finnish banking system, it approximately holds the 40-fold 40 40 amount of minimum reserves as excess reserves. The French system, for example, the 20 fold of uh, minimum reserves as excess reserves, and the Italian banking sector approximately the 10 fold of uh, minimum reserves. So we have a very unequal distribution of excess reserves across nations. And if you look at banking level, which I can't do here, uh, we see it's even more heterogeneous, heter heterogeneous the distribution of excess reserves. So if a bank, if a cash rich bank has to put aside the tenfold, for example, to stick with the example, the tenfold of its minimum reserve requirement, and it has enough liquidity because it's a cash rich bank, it has an opportunity cost of about 4% because this is currently the, the uh, money market rate. On the other hand, if a cash poor bank has to set aside Ten, the tenfold of its current minimum reserves, it first has to acquire the reserves, which might drive up the prices for these reserves, especially if this bank is a weak bank, especially if it's a cash poor bank, especially if it's in a country, <coughs> for example, Italy, where there is not much excess reserves at, at country level. So it might very likely be that those banks experience higher opportunity cost of this monetary policy instrument, so we would introduce uh, heterogeneity in the monetary policy transmission. Uh, this brings me to my end, where um, I would like to conclude, or I want, would like to 
highlight this one point that we cannot be sure how this monetary policy affects the real economy, whether it uh, enhances tightening the, the tightening bias of monetary policy or it reduces it. So uh, again, a word of caution to use this instrument if we don't know exactly how it works. Thank you, Claudia, for staying in time. And now, Robert, your chance to present your findings. Uh, thank you. Claudia has just insisted on the uncertainty of the proposed policy. The burden of my remarks is two near certainties. Let me summarize the presumption of much of the discussion of large unremunerated reserve requirements in the euro area. The presumptions are that banks will pay the tax that will come out of the profits of banks and and second that the depositors will sit still for the tax both of these propositions presumptions strike me as unfounded that is to say the historic evidence is that the banks will <laughs> shift the tax of un large unremunerated reserve requirements to the depositors and history likewise makes it very clear that it's unlikely that depositors will sit still and pay the tax. Instead, depositors will move their money outside of the net of the tax, outside of the Euro area. Why do I, what convinces me, what evidence can I bring to bear that justifies these claims? If we look at the history of the euro dollar market from the 1970s until 1990, when the Fed basically got rid of reserve requirements on large uh, time deposits, what we see is that the immobile depositor paid the tax. In other words, <laughs> banks, US banks, non US banks, had operations in the Caribbean, in London on the one side, in New York on the other side. And what they did was to equalize the all-in cost of funds selling large certificates of deposit in the United States versus Euro dollars in the Caribbean or London. What that implied was that the cost of the reserve requirement got sort of grossed up in the case of the domestic deposit and that was equalized with the euro dollar deposit cost to the banks. So simple arbitrage by banks in funding themselves either onshore in the US subject to the reserve requirement or offshore in the Caribbean or London and not subject to the reserve requirement, simple arbitrage assured that the depositor paid. Now, did depositors just sit still for that? Well, no, they did not. U.S. residents moved sizable amounts of money from domestic deposits into the Caribbean, in, into banks in London that didn't have to pay this tax. So if the reserve base for the tax in the euro area these days is $16 trillion, I would not be surprised if two or three trillion euros moved outside of the euro area. Depositors will not sit still and, and pay the, the tax. And what does this imply for monetary policy in the euro area going forward? Well, it will mean that monetary policy in the euro area is made in a, in a fog because much of Euro intermediation will be happening outside of the Euro area, outside of the ready statistical capacity of the ECB to know what is happening with money, what is happening with credit in the Euro area. This will not make policy making in Europe any easier. So I submit that the law of unintended consequences will have a full sway in this case and that a policy which is in its impulse may be laudable to take a burden off of the 
central banks and kind of stick it to the commercial banks will not have that effect. Instead, depositors will pay, and moreover, the largest depositors will escape offshore and not pay. So that will leave the immobile and smaller depositors to pay the tax, and that, I submit, will be a regressive and unintended outcome of the proposed policy. I thank uh, Ernest uh, Nunn and the organizers of this uh, wonderful uh, gathering for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for sticking to the time and even being shorter than the eight minutes you have been allocated. And that's now Carol's turn to present the findings of his recent empirical work. On the issue. Thanks a lot uh, to the organizers of this webinar for the opportunity to talk about this very timely topic. The reason I, I think why uh, yeah why I'm here is is that I have a, a research uh, project uh, with the title Access Reserves and Monetary Policy Tightening, which is joint work with um, uh, Stefan Kreppmeier and Daniel Fricke, which are two of my colleagues from the Bundesbank. And I would like to um, yeah, base my today's remarks on, on this research project that we have. And uh, the usual disclaimer applies. So the views that I'm presenting here do not necessarily reflect the views of the Bundesbank or the Euro system, but they are my own personal views. Okay, so um, let me motivate our research question by showing you this graph, which um, uh, shows the evolution of um, First of all, um, the aggregate level of reserves, which is the green line. And you can see that uh, reserves in the Euro system have been risen, have been rising uh, in the last years. Uh, so at the end of the year 2022, they accounted for, to more than 4 trillion euros. And to put this into perspective, this accounts to 12% of the balance sheet of banks um, in the Eurozone. <laughs> And the second evolution that I want to, to show you here on this graph is the evolution of the deposit facility rate. So this is the rate that banks obtain when they deposit the reserves with the national central banks. And you see that this rate was negative up until June 2022, meaning that banks had actually to pay when depositing money with, with the central bank. And now after the, 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 uh, in the ECB started to raising interest rates, uh, banks are now earning profits um, on uh, these reserve holdings. So this has created an unprecedented situation. Um, so on the one hand side, we are trying to fight inflation. We are raising interest rates. So we actually want banks to slow down their credit. Um, and on the other hand side, potentially for some banks, we might create an incentive to not slow down their credit supply that strongly. So this is what we actually look at in our research project. So we look whether those banks that have a lot of reserves, whether for them transmission is different as opposed to banks with uh, low levels of reserves. And let me briefly describe the theoretical theoretical mechanism that we have in mind. So in normal times, according to the bank balance sheet channel, when the policy rate is increased, the market value of assets of a bank is uh, decreasing. This weights on their net worth and might potentially lead to a declining credit supply. Now, in the current situation, this, it is different because we now have a hiking cycle with large reserves. So when we are increasing policy rates, again, the market value of non-reserve assets is affected, but banks earn interest income on those reserves, which might potentially <coughs> lead to an increase in the net worth of those banks with a lot of reserves. And this might lead to more credit supply um, of those banks with large reserves as opposed to banks with low reserves. So let me briefly um, walk you through the methodology and what we do in our paper. So we, we empirically evaluate um, whether this mechanism is at work or not by using the NACredit data set, which is a novel and very rich data set containing um, loans from all Euro area banks to non-financial firms. And our sample runs from January 22 until February 23, we have 483 banks in the sample covering 71% of total assets in the Eurozone. 
more than 3 million of firms and more than 43 million bank firm level observations. And what we do is we run uh, the regression that I've uh, shown here on the, at the bottom of the slide. So we regress the log of the credit at the bank firm time level um, on this interaction term between RR, which is the reserve ratio before interest rates were increased, uh, and the DFR dummy, which is taking the value of one after the interest rates were increased. And what we are interested in is this coefficient beta. So this is what we want to estimate. And it shows uh, the differential um, um, effect um, regarding credit supply of banks with large reserve ratios. Uh, as opposed to banks with low reserve ratios. And what is very nice about this data set is that it's very granular and it allows us to control uh, for a lot of things. Uh, most importantly, it allows us to control for credit demand, which we want to control for because what we're actually looking at, at uh, is a credit supply effect. So before I, I go through uh, my main results, which will be on credit supply, let me first show you two slides regarding net worth. So when I was talking about the theoretical mechanism, I said that this is um, something that is necessary to see an effect. So first of all, net worth should be affected. And what I depict here is the evolution of stock market returns of two groups of banks. The blue line shows the evolution of stock market returns of those listed banks with a high reserve ratio. And the, red, the um, black line shows the evolution of uh, those listed banks with a um, um, uh, with a low reserve ratio. And you can see that the evolution of stock market returns for those banks with high reserves um, is much stronger and they face more stock market returns uh, than uh, the control group. So this is first indicative evidence of a net worth effect. What we do is uh, in the paper is to test for that even more directly by looking at the profit and loss accounts of those banks. So uh, what we have is um, the net interest income uh, mm -hmm. ratio um, of those banks and we see that banks with high reserve ratios um, face an increase in net interest income. Um, they face an increase in bank profitability and in bank equity. So in our paper we find evidence that um, the net worth of reserve rich banks is affected positively as opposed to banks with a low reserve ratio. Carol, you have two more minutes. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. So um, let me show you um, now um, our credit um, supply results. And what I've put here is a figure showing the evolution of the total credit volume again for those two groups of banks, those with a high and those with a low reserve ratio. And we see that the evolution of, of credit, um, just looking plain vanilla at the figures, um, is stronger for high reserve banks. And what we then do in our paper is to put this um, into the regression framework where we can um, yeah, control for, for a bunch of things and we confirm uh, this result in, in uh, the credit regressions. And the last slide uh, before I conclude that I want to show you um, is another piece or provides another piece of evidence based on a further data source, uh, namely the bank lending survey, which um, contains self-reported information of banks on their credit supply conditions Again, I divide the sample into two groups of banks, those with a high reserve ratio, the red line, and those with a low reserve ratio, this is the green line. And you see um, that along all those three measures, along all those three credit supply conditions, banks with a high reserve ratio report more favorable credit supply conditions. Um, so this is again, evidence in favor of, 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 of what we find. So let me conclude. Our main finding is that reserve rich banks credit supply is less sensitive to monetary policy tightening. We actually also look at um, yeah, further heterogeneities and find that the credit supply effect is stronger for small and worse capitalized banks. So those are the banks that potentially face more frictions. It is directed towards smaller firms uh, with higher credit quality and uh, we provide indicative evidence that the transmission might be weakened. So let me make this clear. We don't say that the transmission is weak. We just say that it is weakened for those banks with a high reserve ratio as opposed to those banks with a low reserve ratio. And um, yeah, there's an ongoing policy discussion on reserve remuneration. Um, so this would be uh, governing council has decided in July 23 to not remunerate um, minimum reserves. Um, 
There are other policy options um, uh, um, on the table, uh, which we do not evaluate in our paper, but I still want to mention them. So one could be to shrink the balance sheet as it's been done by the Bank of England. And another one is the proposal of, of, of uh, Paul and UMA to, to increase the minimum reserve ratio. And um, I just want to uh, maybe remind you that um, up until 2012, uh, the minimum reserve ratio was at 2%. Was then lower to one percent, and uh, this is also something that that our president has recently said, and it might be, um, yeah, somewhat indicative of the policy space here. So thanks a lot, Howard. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of very good questions now in the chat, but I suggest before we take the questions, we provide you may and Paul with the opportunity to respond to the four presentations in some sleek five minutes, please. Shall, shall I start and, and um, you may, may want to add a few things. And I've put it in, in four sections uh, quickly. There was a lot of talk about heterogeneity, namely bank reserves are unequally distributed. And this may lead to problems. You have countries with um, less reserves, others with more reserves, and therefore if you raise minimum reserve requirements too much, this may lead to scarcity uh, in, in some countries like Italy. Uh, this point was made by several people. Um, well, of course, it all depends on how far you go with minimum reserve requirements. I understand from Nicola that if you keep it reasonable, there shouldn't be a problem. We have also made some calculations and anything up to 5% uh, will not lead to problems um, of, of the distribution, unequal distribution of reserves. And let me remind you one thing, I'm a believer in efficiency of interbank market, right? If some banks have too little and others too much, the interbank market will make sure that this is redistributed at minimal cost. So I, I, one could easily exacerbate and exaggerate this problem. And those who exaggerate this problem are actually not believing that the interbank market works efficiently. On the tax, several um, uh, commentators have called um, the, the transfer, this remuneration, a tax on banks. That is uh, our proposal to have a non-remunerated um, bank reserve, a tax on banks. Yeah, I'm really baffled by that. But assume, okay, let's call it a tax. How will you call the fact that most banks don't remunerate the demand deposits, the side deposits of their own customers. If you call the fact that you would not be remunerated on your deposits at the central bank a tax, then I'm entitled to call a tax by the banks on their own customers when they don't remunerate their demand deposits. And that's a multiple of the tax that the central bank is imposing on commercial banks. So I think we should be uh, a little bit objective here, right? So that, but I don't think it's a good way to call it a tax. I don't think it is a tax. We are in a reserve abundance regime. Without intervention of the central bank, um, the, the rate, the money market rate would be zero, right? Um, now the central bank has raised the rate of remuneration. All what we say is that when, well, since we are still in an abundant regime, part of that <laughs> reserve can actually be considered to, um, uh, to, to be remunerated at zero, and that's not a tax at all. Um, the 4% the, the that the central banks are now transferring to commercial banks are uh, subsidies out of the profits of the banks, and um, I don't think it makes sense to call this our proposal a tax. On evasion, um, also there, Claudia and Robert have made some points. Robert also in apocalyptic terms, you know, it will be horrible what happens. I do observe that um, quite a lot of central banks use minimum reserve requirements significantly higher than the, what the ECB is doing, yet I'm still waiting for the apocalypse there. Um, but if you think it is a big problem, I, we would like to actually reformulate our proposal in the following sense, a kind of asset-based minimum reserve requirements. Instead of computing the minimum reserve as a percent of outstanding deposits of the commercial banks, you just take for each bank the size of their 
bank reserves. And then you tell them um, a fraction of that, say half, will be, is now going to be required reserved, non-remunerated, with no relation at all to the deposit base. And that does away with all these problems, right? There will be, there's no way you can evade that because you cannot, even if you shift your deposit to some other center, the bank that shifts the deposit to another center will still be faced with a necessity to pay, um, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to have reserves that are not remunerated. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Suppose Deutsche Bank has reserve at the central bank equal to 100. The central bank would say 50 will be unremunerated. 50 is um, excess reserves and will be remunerated. All the shifting of the Bundesbank of its deposit base will not avoid the, the Deutsche Bank from the necessity to hold 50 of reserve requirements that are non-remunerated. Last point uh, I want to make yeah. is... Time, Paul, yeah, time. Yeah. Last point that I want to make is that um, I, I hear that we, minimum reserve requirements, it's, it's unclear what the effects are of that. Well, we have shown that we know much more than, than is assumed. But more importantly, if you have two instruments rather than one, this is going to be more effective. Right? And then interest rate and minimum reserve requirements allows you to gear the instruments with some more in minimum reserve requirements. You can allow actually to have a less intense increase in the interest rate. So two instruments is better than one. You may. Um, actually, I wanted to say something about the financial stability issue that actually uh, echo what Paul has said that um, actually, uh, our empirical finding basically says that if you reduce remuneration, you actually can have um, less interest rate increases, which achieve the same target for inflation target, and at the same time, um, ensure the financial stability. So I am um, actually, our proposal provide a more certain world than um, an, a kind of uncertain world um, um, uh, some people tend to believe. So this is what uh, my take on this. Oh, thank you very much. That's a very good uh, transition to the first question in the chat it's by Mr. Duffey or Mrs. Duffey, increasing the costs of holding reserves for banks simply drives intermediation offshore with all its problems on stability. I think uh, we have covered that in the in the various contributions and in Paul's and UMA's reply. If you think otherwise, Ms. Duffy or Mr. Duffy, please let me know. A question from Ennis Knan to Paul and UMA. Uh, comment on the equity channel sounds plausible, but on balance credit volume is already strongly dampened by the ECB's tightening. In that sense, the transmission of the tightening cycle has been effective so far. In addition, given the always looming risk of financial fragility during an abrupt tightening, bolstering banks' equity position can also be regarded as an auxiliary measure to safeguard the banking system from instability during the tightening cycle. This also links with uh, Nicolas' presentation. Paul, you may. Of course, it's, it's always easy to say um, the, the ECB has been successful. We observe now that inflation has declined. <laughs> is that decline of the inflation all due to the interest rate increases? That's the issue, right? Um, how much of the de decline in inflation is due to the fact that um, energy prices have collapsed, right? I mean, when I look at, at that effect, it seems to me that has been much more important in explaining uh, the decline of inflation. But of course, it's easy for a central banker now to say, oh, we did it, you know, uh, it's thanks to our interest rate policy. But this being said, the, the research that we have done and also Carl have, has done is to say that if you remunerate um, reserves, expect that your um, interest rate policy will be less effective than without. That's what we show, right? And I think that's a very firm conclusion now. So we know more than um, what has been said earlier here. We know that this um, 
this existence of remuneration weakens the transmission. And therefore, reducing this remuneration strengthens the, the transmission and allows, as you may was saying, to make a choice. Shall we do it with some more reserve requirements or interest rate? And we have two instruments, and two is always better than one. Well, thank you. Uh, Philip uh, adds an interesting perspective and asks, how much did euro area governments save over the past eight years in interest rate expenditures? Or differently, how much interest income have euro area commercial banks lost over the last eight years due to quantitative easing? Well, we calculated this 60 billion over the last eight years, 60 billion that, that commercial banks paid out to the central banks, and that compares to 146 billion in one year, and it's, we have not yet ended this cycle, right? So, um, yeah, that's the answer. Okay. It's likely, it's likely since the, sorry, the Federal Reserve and also the Bank of England um, have announced that they want to remain in a reserve abundance regime, that this remuneration will continue to be there, right? Because uh, they don't want to return to a scarcity uh, regime. And last point that I want to make in that connection is that during the period prior to um, the inflation surge, when interest rates were, um, the money market rates were uh, even negative minus 0 0.5, the ECB actually used the two-tier system. Then it was possible. When banks were hurt, what did the ECB do? Oh, banks, we have a scheme for you. You don't have to pay the full amount. We will have a tiered system. Part of these reserves, you will not have to pay. When we now say today, when the reverse situation occurs, oh, let's have a two-tier system, then I hear everywhere, it is not possible. We cannot do that. And then I ask the question, why is that? Why was it possible to have a two-tier system that allowed banks to escape paying part of the penalty rate in the past? When that was possible, and now it's not possible anymore. So I, I allocate the questions based on my guesses, but of course, all other panelists are always welcome uh, to contribute their views as well. Now, one question that I think is particularly relevant for Claudia by Tony Brosens, is monetary policy about maintaining price stability or about limiting central bank losses? And Ernest has commented on that. Well, central banks should choose instruments which create as few distortions as possible. So Claudia, what's your take on that? So of course I would answer that uh, uh, maintaining price stability is the overall, the overall objective of monetary policy, but the question we have to answer is, do losses that accumulate over several years uh, threaten the possibility to achieve price stability? So is it a threat to credibility? And in case it is, then uh, central banks probably should care about central bank losses. Only if we can separate it completely and if losses are not threatening uh, credibility in achieving uh, price stability, then we can, can completely ignore it. Thank you very much, Claudia. And now a, a wonderful question, I must say, by Fabian Bichelmeier. He asks, what are the panelists' thoughts on increasing macroprudential capital buffers to conserve the profits stemming from the interest rate income from the deposit facility within the banking system instead of raising the minimum reserve requirement? Who wants to okay. address that question? I'm happy to say a few words maybe and, and let others uh, comment. So the, the role of capital is to um, absorb or buffer against unexpected loss, right? And so we should attach to determination of capital requirements to assessment of risks, microprudential or macroprudential. Here, I think we have, um, we don't have a case where there is more risk that needs to be covered or absorbed by anything. Uh, we are using a tool which is uh, which has a clear purpose. Uh, or we're proposing to use it for another purpose, which I personally find to be uh, an easy and uh, but uh, 
uh, I, I would find that to be uh, how to say not going in the right direction. We have to be careful with one thing that uh, these decisions have an impact not only day one, but in the longer term, in the confidence that is built into the banking system uh, and in the interaction between regulators, supervisors and banks. And all banks, one of the problems that they have at the moment is their lack of attractiveness to foreign investors. Look at their price to book value, for instance, of European banks. So if we continue to um, hit them with capital requirements, especially in this case, unrelated to an increase in risks, um, I, I'm afraid that we are going to just uh, put another fuel to this fire and uh, really have uh, negative uh, ripple effects. Voilà, that would be my view. Thank you. Now, the next question fits perfectly well by Balash Horvath. He proposed another solution. Should these interest gains of banks be subject to a windfall tax over the proposed two-tier reserve system to avoid the mentioned potential side effects? Uh, I see Nicolas is not very happy no, no, about I, windfall that, taxes that's, as well. But, uh, so to me, I, sorry, I don't want to monopolize very quick. To me, that's different because here we're talking about elected governments making a, dis uh, a decision on the distributional effects of a, of a policy, and that's fully in their remit. Um, uh, of course, this is going to, again, be playing that narrative of, you know, interventionism on, on European banks and the fact that profits are being taken away. But there are pros and cons. I mean, governments have also supported banks to a very large extent through the shocks. Uh, the monetary policy at the moment is supporting banks, as Paul is uh, brilliantly showing. So I have a different reaction here uh, because again the the the, the purpose of a, of, a, of fiscal policy is 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 to some extent to to redistribute wealth across uh, the economy, right? So that that would be less of a problem to me. Yeah, can I? Um, banks are making European banks are making record profits, right? That's what we observe today. They make record profits. That is quite surprising because. Typically, when interest rates increase, banks should low, should have lower profits because they borrow short and lend long. And we know that on the liability side, interest rates move faster than on the asset side. So interest rate increases are always bad news for banks. Not this time. Not this time. It's great news for banks. And why is that? Because of these transfers, these massive transfers. And then it's quite appropriate to say, well, something has gone wrong here, right? Something clearly has gone wrong. Um, how can we deal with it? One is a, a tax on excess profits. Um, that's probably theoretically the best way to do it. But practically, it's extremely difficult to do it because it's going to be very difficult to define excess profits in parliaments. There will be endless discussions. And we have seen that certain governments have tried to do it, and it has been an utter, utter failure. And therefore, that's why we say, well, go to the source. I mean, it's because central banks are transferring massive amounts of money to banks that we have gotten into this situation. So let's turn the tap a little bit, not fully, a, a little bit, turn the tap a little bit. The banks will then make less profits and that's fine. I mean, I can live with it, right? Uh, it, it's abnormal that in the present stage, they make so much profit and that I would act on the source of the problem rather than on the ultimate outcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Stefan Kerbel points out an interesting difference in views across the panelists. He's, he argues that, uh, Paul, you may and Carol indicate that the beneficiaries of high reserves and the remuneration are mostly bank equity holders. While on the other hand, uh, Robert and Claudia suggest that the main beneficiaries are small depositors and or bank borrowers. Uh, do we have any indication of, of the distribution of these benefits across the three groups? Carol, Claudia, anyone who want to have a take on that? I see Carol has an interesting graph with differences in, in equity returns. Yeah, maybe these graphs are important, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, the graph shows like the evolution of stock returns for, for banks with high and low reserve ratios and what we see for, for the subsample of listed banks. So this has to be said here for full disclosure. So of course, not all banks are listed on, on the stock market, uh, that those with a high reserve ratio um, face stronger um, yeah, um, stock market returns. Um, so that's what we see in our research. 
Claudia, Robert, Nicolas? I think the, the, the question we have to answer is, yes, the, the econometric exercises, both so those days from you, you may and also from Carol, show that uh, banks that have high reserves that uh, experience in, an increase in their shares and they're profiting and this reduces the effectiveness of monetary policy uh, with these banks. But the question we have to answer is, if we reduce excess reserves via the instrument of minimum reserve requirements, does this uh, lead to the opposite conclusion? So can we just, is it symmetric? Can we just turn it around? And this is what I question. Simply the fact that we reduce the excess reserves will not necessarily lead to the conclusion that it undoes the, the profits and all these things you show in your econometric exercises because it depends on how banks react and if banks react uh, as you say by increase lending rates by more then you're right but if uh, banks react by uh, increasing deposit rates by less then we can't uh, we can't get to this conclusion i'm afraid but i think the, the, this research is very symmetric what Carl shows and what we show is that banks that have a lot of reserves and therefore get a lot of remuneration tend to increase supply of loans. Banks that have lower reserves and less remuneration, right? That's your question. They have less remuneration. They tend to have lower supply of loans. So it works perfectly symmetric. Um, I also would like to add, so, so um, Claudia, all, all your points that, that you made with uh, possible uh, side effects and heterogeneities and avoidance strategies, I, I agree to them. I mean, if, if we increase the minimum reserve ratio dramatically to 5 or 10 percent, we cannot exclude that something of that could happen. And therefore, uh, I think um, what, what could be a nice first step would be to, to mildly maybe increase it to lower the profits from, of banks, mildly increase to two percent and as i've said up until 2012 minimum reserve uh, requirements were at two percent so so i think that this uh, will not create so much distortions we had a look at um, descriptive evidence uh, where we looked at the distribution of excess reserves the liquidity coverage ratio etc and the effects and also nicola uh, has uh, sh uh, showed um, something that goes into this direction so i think like um, yeah increasing it from one to two percent would most likely not create all those side effects uh, but 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 yeah if if we go, f go further i agree that that we should take those into account if if i may yes please robert if if i may the uh results of as as interest rates are rising should be distinguished from what to expect from the policy once it's in place and has held for some time. I think the prospect is very clear that bank equity holders will not pay for the lost revenues. The depositors will, in the medium term, uh, enjoy less of an adjustment upward of their deposit rates because of the unremunerated reserves. To the previous question about the windfall tax, I think it's fair to say that the windfall tax, though it has a very bad reputation, would be less distortionary because it is not a tax on intermediation as are large unremunerated reserve requirements. So it still leaves banks at the margin uh, behaving fairly uh, neutrally between offshore deposits and onshore deposits. That will not be the case with large unremunerated reserve requirements because then banks will have a very strong preference for offshore deposits that will not be uh, part of the base for the foregone uh, revenues. So I, I, I think we need to distinguish sort of this, the short run adjustment dynamics from what to expect from this policy over some reasonable horizon and what we should expect is that money moves out of the euro area and that money moves from the regulated banking system to shadow banks and the, the, that latter effect has strong uh, 
negative implications for the financial stability of the euro area. Can, can, can I quickly respond to this? I, I assume, Robert, that you didn't hear what uh, I said about this. Uh, you can calculate the minimum reserve requirements without reference to deposits. You can easily do it. If, if, you, if you put it on the asset side and you have any contemporary measure of assets as the base, you get the same uh, shifting no, at, possibilities. Not at, not at all. Take, again, take the Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, right? Has, say, 100 of uh, reserves today. Today. Uh, as deposits at the Bundesbank. You tell Deutsche Bank that from now on, half will not be remunerated and the other half will be remunerated. Half, half of the fifth, half of the hundred would not be cannot escape to... this. Cannot escape this. So we could, we could also make the tax on the basis of how many windows there are in the offices of Deutsche Bank uh, in the Euro area. That, that would also have the same feature of the proposal just made. Not at all. No, it's nothing easier. That, that is nothing easier than to, to compute just the percent of the bank reserves that Deutsche Bank holds and say that percent will be not remunerated, the other percent will be remunerated. Or, 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 or the number of, of number of windows on the office. Okay. Of okay. I see that there's no agreement likely within the next two minutes. So I would like to take two more questions instead. One comment by Ivan Salin. The difference between the non-remuneration of reserves by the central bank and the non-remuneration of deposits by banks is that reserves are required, whereas depositors have the choice. Am I wrong? No, I think that's uh, quite right. Uh, unless any one of you... Say in theory, otherwise. yes. Yeah. In practice, uh, depositors uh, don't really have many other avenues of job than deposit into their banks and they get the rates that they get offered. And we see that the deposit beta, which is a measure of how much the banks have passed through to depositors, is extremely low in Europe. That's Especially right. Especially in some systems where there's been a lot of consolidation and there's probably That's a lack of competition across banks. So you see right. the lowest beta in Ireland, Spain, Greece, all these countries where we consolidated the banking system. So in theory, yes, the depositors can arbitrage, but in practice, it's hard. Okay. Thank, thank you very it. much. In practice, only the wealthy depositors have this choice and the, the poor depositors have no choice. Okay, thank you very much. One further comment by Julian Keller, who argues that Nicolas noted that required reserves aren't HQLA eligible, so that's uh, part of the liquidity coverage ratio. Does anyone have a good idea why that's the case? I think I can answer this. Yes, that's due to the fact that when we introduced the LCI in 2013, we argued that the reserve requirements were fully encumbered for monetary policy reasons and therefore were excluded from HQLA in Europe. In Basel, they are part of HQLA, so that's a European choice. And that's something the Euro system can discussed with the SSM already within the existing framework. Well, having said all that, it's five minutes to the end. I would therefore suggest that we have a last round among panelists. First, uh, in reverse order, we start with Carol, then Robert, Claudio, Nicholas, and at the end, Guillaume and Paul. Carol, please, what's your take from the debate today? Thanks again for the opportunity. So, so let me yeah, conclude. So, so what we uh, show in our paper is uh, that we have an unprecedented situation that uh, banks with large access reserve holdings, um, um, the credit supply of those banks is, is uh, less sensitive to the recent rate hiking cycle. And um, um, I've, I've heard uh, arguments uh, in favor and against increasing the minimum reserve requirements and um, all those arguments have to be considered. Um, and uh, yeah, like my key message would be to uh, to remember that, that the minimum reserve requirement was at 2% already uh, up until 2012 and um, that this is maybe something that we, we could um, yeah, try to implement in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Robert. From five kilometers up, to go back to one of the earlier questions, how much did governments gain from QE? Governments are the biggest borrowers in the Euro area. They, are, it follows, are, were the largest beneficiaries of, this, of the suppression of interest rates to negative ranges in many cases uh, for an extended period of time. 
So from that perspective, the central bank losses that we're now observing are small endogenous offsets, small endogenous offsets to the huge gains that governments have enjoyed and continue to enjoy from low long-term uh, interest rates. And, and so the sense that there is a problem here uh, in, from a public sector uh, debt perspective may be misplaced. That is to say, from the broader perspective, consolidating the central bank and the finance ministry's debts, there is a perhaps distributional issue, but there does not seem to me a, a real a first rate problem here. Axel Weber used to say, I don't think about Bundesbank profits in the morning, I don't think about them at lunchtime, and I don't think about them at dinner time. Was that before he left the Bundesbank? It was while he was at the Bundesbank, I okay. believe. Okay. okay, thank you, Robert. Claudia. Uh, thanks a lot for these very good discussions. Um, I think we very clearly worked out the different line of reasonings and the differences in our opinions. There is just one point um, where I think it's, which is still open. This is the interbank market efficiency. I think we learned uh, in the great financial crisis that uh, the money market is not functioning very well in the euro area. We have some sort of fragmentation there. And I would not rely currently on money markets to distribute excess reserves uh, frictionlessly uh, around all the banks. So this is why my, my concerns come comes from. So there is also a different line of reasoning. I still think that there is some fragmentation in money markets, so they might not distribute reserves uh, very well. And uh, so we can also uh, define the different opinions here very clearly. Thanks a lot again for uh, having me as a discussion. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you, Claudia. Nicolas. Thanks a lot. So, and thanks to Prof. De Gov and uh, Prof. G again for bringing this topic on the table. Um, I think indeed they point their finger to the fact that there is a, a relatively abnormal situation at the moment in many extent, which is the result of QE and the unwinding of that. Uh, their proposal faces two types of reactions from what I can see in the debates. There's one reaction that it would be a threat to the bank. I think on that, our view is that unless you go to very extreme, the impact should be broadly manageable given the current profit and liquidity situations of the banks. Uh, and then there's the question of the interbank market, but I would tend to also agree that having a functioning interbank market should, should be part of our normal functioning. Uh, and the other lines of argument is around the perverse effects and the kind of uh, unintended consequences that it, this can have. And here, indeed, I think uh, th there are some, uh, uh, there will be some winners and losers of the situation and uh, the big depositors and the big banks are, are probably in a better situation. But is that a cost that we should accept for a policy that re uh, reaches other objectives? That's the question for central bankers. Thank you. You main Paul, your take from the discussion. I just want to remind that the current regime of reserve abundance actually in the last 100 years we never experienced and now this is a kind of new um, regime that actually um, we need to use many more creative um, measures including for example the minimum reserve requirement and we are the kind of um, actually most of us are kind of the economists um, who have been educated that interest rate is the main tools to fine tune the monetary policy. Um, but I think probably we can be cautious, but we also need to be creative in um, elaborating our monetary policy. Okay, um, so yes, let me also say that uh, I enjoyed the discussion, very good points were made, a lot of debating. Uh, we, we stress two points essentially, one of fairness, um, there are massive transfers to banks these days um, at the expense of um, the budgetary authorities. It's now in the Eurozone more than 1% uh, a year, which is quite unprecedented. Um, and there is a problem of effectiveness. And, and as you may have said, um, it's better to use um, more than one instrument, right? You can use the interest rate and the reserve requirements and let's be creative to see how we can combine the two so as to have a more effective 
uh, monetary policy. Thank you, Paul. And you may thank you all very much for your contributions you. on the panel. A fascinating seminar. And I would also like to thank uh, the audience and wonderful questions that have been asked there. I'm sorry that we could not go through all of them, but I think that uh, Dagana and Ernest uh, will have the opportunity to forward the questions to the panelists so that they are not lost and will be answered in, in due course. I found it extremely exciting and very efficient. Thank you very much. Ernest, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. This concludes our Swerf Buffy Bocconi webinar on expanding zero interest rate and minimum reserve requirements, aims, effects and side effects. Uh, thanks also from my side to Paul UMA, to Nicola, Claudia, Bob and Carol for sharing your analysis with us. Thanks to all of you for participating and for posing so many questions. Uh, Stefan, we can confirm that we, we can share the, the, the questions uh, with the speakers so that you can continue the discussion between each other. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for uh, moderating uh, this so fluently. Bye-bye and take care. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.